Hello, my name is Annie and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking about medieval female authors. A misconception about the medieval period is that women didn't write or didn't participate in the literary process or in making manuscripts. Many women did write, and in several different genres. A common way through which women gained access to literacy was through convent life. And so a lot of the texts written by women in the medieval period are religious texts, as we'll talk about later on. But women also wrote in a lot of different genres, like poetry, romance, medical texts, literary criticism, and other things too. And today I'll be talking about three authors who I absolutely love and I think really shaped the literary world and that I would recommend to anyone. These are some of the most well-known female authors of the medieval period, but because they're so important, I think they're a good starting point. And by no means do I mean to cover all female authors in one video, so this is likely to be a part one. Though there's no denying that misogynistic discourse permeated a lot of texts in the medieval period, that is not to say that women did not fight back against that discourse. And on that note, we're going to talk about our first author, and that is the incredible Christine de Pizan. The first woman to live from her writing and to fight back against a lot of claims that were made about women in literature, Christine was born in Italy in 1364, but she moved to France at an early age and all her writings were in French. Her father worked in the court of King Charles V, and there Christine had the opportunity to read and write even though she wasn't a noblewoman. Christine was married in 1380, but her husband died 10 years later, leaving her with three children and she had to make do. So she started working in the production of manuscripts. Later on, at the end of the century, Christine started writing her own texts and she started with love poems and love ballads that were really pleasing to the aristocracy of France. As she was really successful in writing for nobility, she was commissioned to write the biography of King Charles V. Even in the early years of her writing, Christine already started dabbling in literary criticism, famously writing letters criticizing Jean de Mont's continuation of the Romance of the Rose and the way he portrayed women in that. Christine fought back the idea that women were more inherently prone to sin than men, focusing on the similarity between the sexes instead of their differences and saying that being prone to sin is a human fault, not a woman's fault, like Jean de Mont said in his text. This argument is also at the heart of Christine's most famous work, which is The City of Ladies, and that is the work I'll be focusing on today. The work starts with Christine reading in her library, and she picks out a book which she thinks will be harmless reading. But in it, she encounters discourse that is very aggressive and says awful things about women, and she ends up feeling awful after reading it. She says that, yet, after having looked at this book, which I considered to be of no authority, an extraordinary thought became planted in my mind, which made me wonder why on earth was it that so many men, both clerks and others, have said and continue to say and write such awful, damning things about women and their ways. After having these thoughts and wondering why so many men wrote these things about women, Christine feels dejected, describing herself as an aberration of nature and wondering why are women bad? But then three women show up in front of her and claim they are sent from God and they are reason, rectitude, and justice. And they tell Christine not to feel sad about being a woman and say that she shouldn't believe all that is written about women in texts written by men. They say that they are here to show Christine how these texts are false and that if she searched her own experiences, she will already know that some of the things that are said about women are not true. The ladies say that they will lead Christine through history so that she could meet women who are virtuous and prove all these things wrong. They are to help Christine build a city of ladies for these virtuous women, where they will be protected from the criticism and the awful things that are said about women in texts. I absolutely love Christine de Pizan. Every time that I read her, I'm just in awe. And when I read about her, I'm also very impressed. And I would highly recommend her. She has lots of texts in readable translations that honestly feel like reading modern texts sometimes. And yeah, I think she's a great starting point for someone who wants to read about women in the Middle Ages. Now let's shift gears a little and move on to another genre, and that is religious writings. I see no better person to start with than Julian of Norwich, who is considered the first confirmed female author in the English language. 
And I say confirmed because a lot of texts are anonymous, so it is likely that other women wrote before her, but Julian is the first that had her name attached to it. Julian lived between 1342 and sometime after 1416, we don't know exactly when she died, and she is known for writing her two versions of Revelations of Divine Love, the short text and the long text, which she wrote some time apart. In her writings, Julian tells of the experiences that she had in 1373 and sometimes after. When she was very close to death, she was sick for three days and in that sickness she had visions or what she describes as showings of Jesus Christ in his passion. These showings were received in her mind and sometimes through imagery, sometimes through words directly transferred into her head. And Julian felt that because they were sent from God, she had to write about them and tell them to people. Though her book is a personal account, Julian doesn't really focus on herself that much, so we don't know a lot about her life. But we do know that when she had the visions in 1373, she was living at home but likely sometime after, she became an anchoress. An anchorite was someone who lived in isolation, likely in cells and churches, in order to achieve a perfect spiritual state. Julian's visions reveal her desires to experience Christ's passion in the utmost detail, and this wish was something that was very common in the late Middle Ages. Julian really wished to show her audience what she experienced, and she makes use of lists in other order to do that, and her writing becomes very fluid. And she often claims that she is ignorant and not educated enough to convey the meaning of those visions. Though she admits that she is uneducated and ignorant in her texts, she, you can see that she has the wish to say what she wants to say, as we can see in this passage. God forbid that you should say or assume that I am a teacher, for that is not what I mean, not that I ever mean it. For I am a woman, ignorant, weak, and frail. Just because I am a woman, must I therefore believe that I must not tell you about the goodness of God, when I saw at the time both his goodness and his wish that it should be known? Both texts start with Julian wishes for three things. To experience Christ's passion in detail, to have bodily sickness, and to be given three wounds. This all comes back to the idea of experiencing Christ's suffering in the most detail possible. Though I usually have difficulty reading medieval religious texts, as my focus is on romance, reading Julian was something kind of special. Her text is very fluid, and though she claims she's ignorant and uneducated, I find that her writing flows beautifully and it has that honesty that really makes you connect to her and makes the reading easier for someone who is not really used to reading religious texts. The third and final author I'll be talking about today is Marjorie Kemp, who feels like a good segue to, from Julian since they likely met in the early 15th century. Kemp was born in 1373 and she was a daughter to a very successful merchant and politician of the city of Lynn. She was married at the age of 20 and subsequently gave birth to 14 children. Her work is The Book of Marjorie Kemp, which is considered by some the first autobiography in the English language. But the question of authorship is something that we should address with Marjorie Kemp's book, because in the introduction it is said that Marjorie narrated her story to an acquaintance and he wrote it all down, but then a priest went to read it and he said it was very ill-written and he couldn't understand some of it, so he edited it and then someone else also had a hand at changing the text. Though it's hard to tell if the words we're reading are actually Marjorie's or if there are layers upon layers of writers, I decided to include Marjorie Kemp's book because it is a very honest account of her life and I think it's a very interesting read. So the book tells Marjorie's life story starting after her marriage and the birth of her first son. And after those events, Marjorie goes through a period where she is affected by the devil and is very wicked to those around her and wants to harm herself. But then she is shown a vision of Jesus Christ, who she describes as the most handsome man she's ever seen and he helps her get out of that phase. She then tries to invest in brewing ale and a horse mill, but those enterprises fail. And after that, she apologizes for trying to have worldly honor and becomes very devout, 
as she receives visions from Jesus, Mary, and God. She starts losing all desires to sleep with her husband, which causes a very <laughs> a great point of contention between them. The way that the book addresses sex and those intimate relationships is very surprising for someone who hasn't read it before. And I think there's no better way to explain it than by reading a passage from the book. Marjorie, if a man came with a sword and wanted to chop off my head unless I had sexual intercourse with you, as I used to before, tell me the truth from your conscience. As you say, you won't lie. Whether you allow my head to be chopped off or else allow me to have sex with you as I previously did. Alas, sir, she said, why are you raising this matter? Haven't we been chased this eight weeks? Because I want to know your heart's truth. And then she said with great sorrow, truthfully, I'd rather see you slain than we should return to our uncleanliness. And he said back, you are not a good wife. After many discussions with her husband, she finally convinces him to be chaste. And she had received other instructions from God, such as dressing in all white and talking to people about their sins. While Marjorie's book also deals with themes of religion and visions, it could not be more different than Julian's. It is a very personal account and very honest, and it has a more narrative form than Julian's. So I think it's a very entertaining read, if I'm being honest, even for someone who doesn't focus on religious texts and it gives you an inside scoop into her life. And so I would highly recommend it. So these are three medieval authors that I absolutely love and that I would highly recommend. And I think they represent three very different styles of writing from the medieval period. These authors don't even begin to cover all the women who were writing in the Middle Ages, but I think they're a great starting point and I would highly recommend them. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.